offer a propose um, maybe to leave these three problems in chapter eight in the homework. Um, Okay. Hmm? And I have it due, uh, let's say, Friday this week. Um, but if you've done it by, by Wednesday, that's fine. But um, <clears throat> whatever that is. Fifth. Fifth. Seventh. Okay. Um, let's see the final exam. Um, I'll post it on the web tonight, so and I'll email you. So, uh, so it will be due um, on Wednesday, May uh, twelfth. Let's say five p.m. Um, I mean, originally was, I mean, the in class was supposed to be on Monday, um, a week from today. Um, but being a take home, I said, you know, just um, you can have two more days. So let's see the final exam. So this would be posted to be posted um, later tonight. <laughs> And I'll email everybody. So um, just try to have a look at it before Wednesday, so we can. Uh, if there are any questions, we can discuss them on Wednesday. Um, also, I'll have some extra office hours. So let's say I have office hours. So this week um, will be on Tuesday tomorrow from 1:30 to 3. And um, the usual Wednesday, 10 to 11, but it's not a very popular time. Um, I'll also be here on Friday if you're um, between, um, I guess, 10 and 12. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to stop by. Let's see, I think that's all I had for the announcements. Uh, I handed in the solutions to the last homework. So, um, I'm going to post solutions to the last home, to the homework number 10 on Friday. So, uh, okay, so I, I want to make the due Friday uh, by noon. Okay? So I can post solutions. And, um, Let's see anything else. I was sad to see that the oil spill is actually now it's gotten such a huge issue, right? But it's because it keeps it keeps spilling. Right? It keeps keeps coming in these. For those of us that uh, had uh, Good time in New Orleans <laughs> for some time. You can appreciate, I mean, how bad this is. Um, okay, so let's see. So uh, the plan for basically today and Wednesday is to talk a little bit about um, Markov chains. Unless, unless there are any. <coughs> And of course, um, okay. yes. Um, if we, okay. No, never mind. You'll have the solutions posted. And so, um, how well we did or not did on our own homework, um, I'll do that. Uh, I'll do that in post. If we, if we need any ideas from our homework for the final exam, we can look at uh, the solutions that are posted. Up. Yeah, and it's a good idea to keep make a copy of your, of your home of, of your own uh, homework when you submit it. Um, and I'll try to grade it by you know next week by Monday, say if you're. 
Sorry? No, there's no class. They've changed the policy. Yeah. Uh, the final will be on uh, chapter six, seven, and eight. So just on the um, kind of chaotic behavior and probabil probabilistic. Yeah. <laughs> no, because I, I, I've made myself an image of what that causes. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's uh, let's just talk about. We have limited time, so I don't know how much we'll be able to do on Markov chains, but. Some of you that already took or are taking the stochastic modeling class have probably seen this extensively. So the point here is that I would like to uh, talk about some um, processes that um, are random and they have only a discrete number of states. So it is it is kind of limiting to only certain um, uh, certain models. I mean, you can only use uh, this for certain situations, but uh, but it's kind of a start of the more um, broad, the broad topic of, of stochastic model models. Um, so basically, in the, the physical models, the physical model models. Um, that you know the underlying physical model system, excuse me, is um, that takes only finite number of states uh, and. Uh, that can transition uh, between states uh, with a certain probability, with some probability, uh, these usually can be modeled Uh, with so-called Markov chains or a Markov chain and <coughs> what's important to, to understand is that transitions between states can only take a place at, at, at uh, like finite intervals of time. So it's a discrete, so this is a discrete model, stochastic model, uh, the transitions take place at um, regular, if you want, intervals of time, every second, every hour, every day, or, you know, um, doesn't even have to be uh, regular, but it's just a prescribed time. So it's not a continuous uh, dependence of the state. Okay? And let's call, so, system, uh, schematically, if, for instance, if this physical state takes three, the physical system can take one of three states, so every moment of time you have uh, the state one characterizing the system, or state two, or state three characterizing the system. And with possibility of moving from at regular, you know, at intervals, distinct intervals of time, from like state one to state two with a certain probability. 
and we're going to introduce this notation of Pij to be the probability of the system in state I to transition or jump to state J. Okay, and you have also a certain probability of uh, the system from state 2 to move to state 3 and so forth, right? And of course you could have um, B31. You could have that the, the system that stays, you know, is in state 1 stays in state 1 and that would be P11. P22, P33. Now oftentimes if if any of this probability is zero, you know, maybe you just don't draw that um, that arrow or that edge, right? Also it's possible that the system in state two would move back to state one and so forth, right? State one to state three. So this would be sort of a, oops, this would be a complete graph. But notice that, I mean, keep in mind that some of these probabilities may be zero. Okay? And uh, there is an example we're going to talk about that has probability zero and some, some of them. So certainly the, these numbers are between zero and one as being probabilities. And there's another very important property of these, and that is if you're if you're in any of the states, the next iteration of the system, so the next time um, you have to go somewhere. I mean, either you have to also be in another state. So, so if you're in state one with 100% probability, so it's certain that you're going to either be in state 1, 2, or 3 in the next time interval. And that amounts to uh, saying that the sum of the probabilities, let's see, if you state i, and you're summing up over J, so Pij, um, again, if you have three states, it's going to be for each i from 1 to, 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 to 3, but for each state, you have the sum of Pij uh, run over J to be 1. Okay? Okay, so this leads to, to keep this kind of self-contained, it's easy to um, introduce or to keep these uh, numbers in a, in a metric. So transition metrics, P, capital P, stands for P11, P12, P13, in this case with 3, P21, P22, P23, P31, P32, P3. Three, and what's uh, what's important to, uh, about this metric is that the row sums or the sums along each row are all equal to one. And of course, they're all positive. I mean, excuse me, between zero and one, it could be some, could be zero, or one, or sums. Are all positive, equal to one. Okay. So this defines P is called such a P. So such a matrix that has uh, these pro properties is called. Oops. Eh. Okay. P is called stochastic matrix.
if all entries are positive and the rows or sums equal to 1. Okay? Or non negative. Okay, so here's, here's the example that um, uh, uh, to start with. So the example is <coughs> this inventory, pro inventory problem. That's number 8.1. Okay. And um, it has to do with, I guess, inventory of aquarium, aquariums, um, or aquaria. I don't know uh, what's the plural here. But um, what happens is at the end of each week, there is uh, an inventory that's, that's uh, being done. And um, depending on how many were sold during that week, a uh, certain, certain uh, strategy for, for, uh, for um, ordering for the next week um, are used. So the policy is that um, if there is nothing left, so everything, if everything was sold, at the end of the week, then uh, there's going to be three aquariums. So um, there are going to be three aquariums um, ordered, right, for the next week. If there is any, you know, if the if the uh, there is at least one aquarium in stock, then there is nothing ordered, right? The policy is based on the observation that the store only sells an average of one aquarium per week. Okay, so it's saying that if even if there is only one uh, in store at the end of the week, it's likely that no more than one on average is going to be sold, so they're not going to order. Okay, so. So why is this, a, why is this uh, system sort of modeled using the Markov chain? Or, you know, I guess um, in its simplest um, the simplest approach is to think about this uh, number of number of aquarium at the end of the week. Okay, so there could be, or at the beginning of each week, okay? So at the beginning of each, of, of each week, you could have one, two, or three. Can you have zero? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have zero at the end of the week, the next uh, you order three, right? So you really never have zero. That's why zero is not a state. So this is... I thought zero was a possible state because... They're saying that uh, the question says it's adequate policy to guardians uh, potential lost sales because the customer uh, requesting one when they're out of stock. Okay, but that's the question. Hmm? The que okay, so, so... So if they're out of stock, then, uh, then you have a possible state of zero. Okay, but but let, let me let me clarify. So so these this represent the state the inventory at the beginning of each week. Okay, so you cannot have zero because you've ordered three. If if you had zero, okay, then you've ordered three. So you start the week always with something. The question, though, the question asks is, what if during that that next week, your de the demand is actually higher than what your inventory is? What's the probability of that happening? So we're assuming that the time interval between order and receiving. Yeah. We're, we're ignoring that. No, yeah, we're ignoring everything. Yeah. We're just assuming that that's just okay. Simplest. Simplest okay. possible. As soon as we order, we have stuff. Yeah. yeah. 
It's next door. Okay, garage sale, whatever. Okay, so um, all right, so so there is there is going to be uh, probabilities of something happening. Um, for instance, what's the probability that you start one week with um, with inventory of one, right? And you move the following week with inventory of two. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is. Um, It's, it's a little bit. Uh, I mean, to get to the probability, to, to the um, to the actual probability, it's uh, a little bit. We, we need to go through another uh, another step. So that is the following. So so let's call x n to be the number of aquaria or aquariums at the beginning of a week. N, okay, and let's call DN to be the, the demand for aquariums uh, during that week, during weekend. Okay, so trying to figure out what's the probability of uh, moving from one state to another. Okay. All right, so I have we have the following. What's the probability that um, you are in state one and you are in the next week you're going to be in state one? Okay. Well, that probability is obviously going to be equal to the probability that um, the demand during that week is zero. Okay? So, we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, what's called conditional probability, but Clearly, uh, you're going to start with you know one aquarium, and the following week you're going to have one aquarium if there is nothing sold, right? So, the first thing to uh, to decide is what should be the probability that uh, the demand is zero, or what is the probability that the demand is any any given number? Okay. Well, so the question is that. This um, um, random variable, which is the demand for aquarium, is a discrete random variable, right? So this is a discrete <coughs> random variable and can take uh, values 0, 1, 2, right? It could be, the demand could be huge, right? So in, in theory, it could be any any, um, any any integer, right? So the question is, what is the probability density uh, distribution? So the probability de distribution is assumed to be exponential, or excuse me, Poisson. 
because it's discrete and it models this kind of time over I mean uh, number of arrivals if you want during any given week okay so it's going to be very low probability that that this d is going to be high it's going to be a reasonably high probability that this d is going to be uh, small so so this is going to be our assumption assumption is Uh, that the probability that dn takes value any value k is going to be e to the minus lambda lambda to the k over k factorial okay now the question is this is Poisson what is the um, rate so recall the expected value of the Poisson distribution is actually lambda, right? So, if in our case we're talking about uh, one, what was it? One, right? Observation of the store only sells an average of one. Uh, aquarium per week, right? So, <clears throat> so the assumption is that this is equal to one, in which case the probability that dn is any k should be considered to be uh, e to the minus one over k factorial, right? So, so let's just. Uh, write this down. So what is the probability that the demand during weekend is going to be zero? And it's just e, it's e to the minus one, right? One over e, whatever that is. Um, what is the probability that there will be one um, so same, right? e to the minus one. Probably there's going to be demand of two this should start to drop, right? e to the minus 1 over 2. By the way, these numbers are 0 0.368, I believe. 0 0.368. Um, well, this is half of it, right? So 0 0.184, right? and so forth. What's the probability that, that the demand is going to be 3? Well, right? So it's going to drop. Is this, is this a, a fair assumption? Well, it depends on the market, right? Um, I guess conditions or something, but that, that is an assumption to a working, a working assumption, okay? So these probabilities will basically affect this transition probability. So this P11, now we know what the P11 is, right? We'd have to compute, okay, so now let's go back to the, um, transition probability. So P11 is going to be, um, n plus 1 is 1, given that xn is 1. So this is going to be probably that dn is 0. So this is 0 0.368. Uh, let's compute the, the next one, which is, I guess, um, well, the easy, easy ones are the ones where x um, n plus 1 is 2, given that xn is 2. This is the same. So the event basically is, can be can be uh, characterized by there's no demand during that week, right? So that is going to be the same. 0 
But unfortunately, P33 is not going to be that easy. So the P33 is, is the probability that during week three there are three, the beginning of week three, uh, week n plus one, there are three, given that at xn equals three. So here there are two possibilities. There are two um, mutually exclusive or disjoint events, right? So is the probability that there is no, so there were three and there is no, no sales. So that, that is one possibility, that there is no demand, right? But it's also the, pro the probability that there is, everything was sold, right? All those three were sold during that week and then you have replenished, right? So is it probably that? Isn't the same true for two and two? No, because... We have demand of two. But then it replenished to three. So you can never start the week with... If, if you sold everything during the previous week, you always replenish with three. Okay? So, so this one... Okay, so now the question is, how do you compute this? Well, it's obviously going to be a series. Okay? So you can do it as a series, or... It's uh, possible to think about the complement event, that is, complementary event, that is... So this is going to be... 1 minus the probability that neither of these happens, right? Which means is the probability that dn is 1 and the probability that dn is 2. Okay? And now, now this is... Uh, you can compute this. So, so it's going to be um, 0 0.368 minus... and the, the other one was half, right? One point. Eight four, and I think this ends up being zero point four four eight. Of course, it's the first three decimals. Okay. All right. So, so again, I'm going to leave this uh, because it wasn't clear in the beginning how to compute this. But now, now we can uh, start to make ourselves an image of this Markov chain. So it basically says um, P11 uh, P22 and P33 Okay, but now uh, of course the other ones need to be computed. So for instance, what's the probability that uh, you start with one and the next week you have two? Zero. Right, it's impossible to end up with two during any given week unless you started with two or the previous week. Yeah. Could you say a few words on how you got the complement? You mean here, this one? Yeah. Well, remember the the. Well, you, you have a, a runner variable that takes discrete amount of... Uh, so it has a, a probability distribution, right? So it has a probability that it's zero, that it's one, that it's... and so forth, right? So basically every each of this bin is a probability of an event, right? And these events, you know, the union of those... those events are mutually exclusive and they add up to a certain event. Because something has to be, right? The, probably the D has to be something. Yep. Uh, at, each, at each week, D has to be equal to something. So all we do here is, is say if the sum of these things equals 1, well, and we're only looking at the, basically at the 1, which is 0. So I'm going to use the red to indicate... So this is 0, 1, 2, 0 is here, right? So it says the probability uh, that of the event that, that this happens, right? And this happens 
is 1 minus the, prob the sum of those two probabilities. That's all. So the sum of everything is, is 1, right? That's, um, and these are mutually exclusive events. Right. So the probability that, that dn is greater than equal to 3 is 1 minus 0.368 minus 0.368 minus 0.184, and you're just, you're just canceling those 0.368s there. Yeah. One of them. Right. Right. Well, uh, so, so again, this, this, this is just to avoid writing, uh, computing a series, right? That series. That, that, that will be a series from 3 to infinity of those exponentials, right? Okay. All right, so, uh, so there's nothing between 1 and 2. So you can draw and, and draw 0, or you just avoid drawing that. Um, let's see something that actually is not 0. So from 1 to 3, so what's the probability that uh, you start with xn plus 1 is one is 3 when you start it with xn equals 1. How can you write that event in terms of d? Greater than or equal than 1. Again, demand could be very high, right? You can only sell what you have, but uh, the demand could be very high. With low probability, but it could be very high. Okay, so this is, again, the same thing. This is 1 minus what, what, uh, what, ev what probability of what event? Zero. The dn is 0, right? So this is 1 minus 0 0.368. So this is whatever, 0 0.632, okay? So that's a pretty high probability that from 1 you move to 3, right? And then you can, you can uh, keep doing this. So l let me just leave this and write what tap, what the matrix is. So that's the nice thing about putting everything in a matrix. You can see everything at once without having to draw all those uh, arrows. So this is 0 0.368, 0, 0 0.632. Second row is we haven't computed P21, but it ends up being when the demand is 1, and that's 0 0.638, 368. Um, we haven't really computed the probability that you start with 2, you end up with 3. But again, that translates into an event of um, related to the random variable D. And the last row is this one. Okay, so this is a three by three stochastic matrix. Okay, and now the question is, what do you do with this? So, what do you, uh, what is this matrix used for, or this uh, probability uh, transition probabilities used for? So. Um, I guess I, I should talk a little bit about the conditional probabilities. So, so let me make a, a parenthesis here, and um, so we don't necessarily see this, uh, you know, ugly numbers here. So let me just simplify. So consider a simpler. Um, three state Markov chain. Um, as follows. So I mean same three states, so zero one, one two and three. Okay, and let's imagine that we have 
the uh, random variable that has uh, basically just is the state at time n and it has the following distribution. So it is state 1 with a certain probability and I'm going to take uh, you know just different numbers. Let's say it's it's equally likely that this uh, St this um, the state is one, two, or three. So the probability that x one is is one is one third. That x one is two is one third. That x one is three is one third. Okay. And consider so consider the. the uh, transition metrics to be the following so let me um, write this down one third one third one third seven tenths three tenths zero zero one zero Okay. I guess I should have said what x naught is. So x naught, I want x naught to be one. So I want to start at one and I want to move in the next state. So state at time one with equal probability at being one third. Back uh, one third probability is at back at one. One third probability is, is at two. One third probability is one third. Right. So the question is, what will x two be? So what is the state at second time going to be? Okay. Well, so here we need to, obviously it's going to be 1, 2, or 3 with probability that x2 is 1, which we need to compute with x is going to be 2 with the probability that we need to compute, and it's going to be 3 with the probability that we need to compute. So let's take it uh, one at a time. So what's the probability that that the second state or, or the state of the system after second iteration is actually one? Hmm? Um, Let's see. Did I, okay, so I gave the, the transition uh, metrics here, but it's not that clear, you know, because you can actually be in, uh, let's see, state, state the second time uh, you're in state one, but you could be staying in state one, right, and just between one and two, you go, you, you stay in state one, right? Or you could be going to state two and then coming back to state one. What is that probability? That probability is seven tenths. Or you could be going to state three and then going back to state one with 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 well, that's actually zero probability, right? So I think this is accurate diagram. No, there's there's a probability that if you're in state two, you come back to state two. Uh, no, if state three to one is zero. Just the way I wrote here. Oh, one zero zero. Okay, so let's. 
So then um, that changes what? Three two is zero, right? So three one is one. Okay. Right. So if you're if you're in state three, with with well, probably one, you go back to one, right? So you can you can actually x two. So x two is a state of time two. It could be one. Uh, as follows. So here's here are all the possibilities. There's a probability that x uh, two is one, given that x one was one, right? So let's see. This is times the probability that x one was one plus. So I'll say in a second uh, this conditional probability is the probability that x2 is 1, that x1 is 2, times the probability that x2, x1 is 2, plus the probability that x2 uh, is 1, given that x1 was 3, times the probability that x1 was 3. Okay. So here we knew we use the following notation. So uh, P of A and B, A condition B or A given B is a conditional probability of the event A given B and in discrete probability the, there is A way to define this, actually, I think in general, um, by definition, this conditional probability is a probability that both events A and B happen when the sample space is reduced, is kind of is um, is reduced or is restricted to B, right? So. So here's a picture in general. If I have, this is my sample space, and I don't know, I think we use it S for discrete, right? If this is a sample space, and this is the event B, okay? And I have some event A, let's say it kind of overlaps, partially overlaps with this, right? Then what are we, what are we doing? We're saying that the new sample space is just B because Given that B happens, what is the probability that A will happen, right? So at least when you do counting, you know, uh, when it's equally likely outcomes, you can see that the probability that A will happen, knowing that B already happened, or that B happens, is the number of, element of outcomes in, in the intersection divided by the favorable out uh, possible outcomes, right? So it's the ratio between P of A intersect B and B. Okay? So now why do we actually uh, do that uh, product that, that I wrote there? Well, so imagine that I have, for instance, that the event A is the event that X2 is 1. Okay? And the event B1 is the event that X1 was 1. B2 is the event that X1 was 2 at the previous at the, at the time one. And B3 is the event X1 was 3. So I have these three events. By the way, they are mutually exclusive. What does that mean? It means their the, their union is actually the whole space, the whole sample space, and they 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 don't intersect each other, right? Yeah. So we have I have three events. So now 
at, at, at state at uh, time one. Now at time two, I'm looking at the event that x2 is one. So what can I write? I can write that the probability that if the event a, actually just the event a, a I can I can split the event a into the following. I can split the event A into three sub-events. I mean, if I had three colors. Right, so this is... This is B1. This is B2. B2 here and B3 here, right? And my event A is somewhere in here, right? So this is going to be is the disjoint union of three of three sub events, if you want, event A, right? Being disjoint, it means that the probability of the event A is the sum of the probabilities of the sub-events. And now all it's left to do is to say, uh, if can you write this in terms of conditional probabilities? Well, so if, if the conditional probability is the ratio between the probability of the intersection and the probability of B1, for instance, then this intersection is going to be probability of A given B1 times the probability of B1, right? Plus and so forth, right? Probability that A given B2 times the probability of B2 plus probability that A given B3 times probability of B3, okay? So that's exactly what... It's just, this, this is just a set theoretical, if you want, um, um, <clears throat> computation, except here I use this concept of conditional probability. Okay, so that's actually what, what, what we wrote here. So it's the probability that the event A is split into three probabilities. And we use conditional probability because these are just those transition probabilities, right? So let's, let's just compute uh, again that P of X2 is 1. So what's the probability that x2 is 1 given x1 is 1? That's p1, uh, p11, right? Times the probability that x1 was 1. That was conveniently chosen to be 1 third. Okay? But then is the probability that p, uh, p2 is 1 given that p1 is 2. So that's p21 probability that x1 is 2, and p3, 1, probability that x1 is 3. So what was p1, 1? One? One, one third. <coughs> what is the probability that x1 was 1? That was one third, right? p2, 1 was 7 tenths, and then one third, plus p3, 1 was 1, and this was one-third, okay? So what is that? Seventeen over... Is it ninety? No. 
47 over 90. No, that's not even true. Uh, 10, 21, and 30, 61, yep. Okay? So that's how you, then what's the probability that x2 is 2? It was going to be p11, probability that, uh, excuse me, uh, p12, probability that x1 is 1, plus p22, probability that x1 is 2, and, prob and p23, uh, no, p32, probability that x1 is, is 3, okay? So, it seems like something that uh, becomes tedious, but fortunately there is going to be a pattern here, which very soon uh, we'll write down. But, um, so, let me just do this one. So, one-third and one-third plus three-tenths and one-third plus zero times one-third, right? Okay, so that's, this is 19 over 90, right? One-ninth and one-tenth, right? Okay, and finally P, probability that X2 is 3 is, so you see why it's easier to work with this number than with those coming from the inventory problem. Uh, P, um, P31 and so forth, right? And since we look at the metrics, we can tell this is 1 times 1 third plus 0 times one third plus zero times one third. So this is one third or if we were to put it over ninety uh, one nine. No. P three was one, right? P three one was one? Is it like 30 over 90? So does it add up to, it should add up to 100, right? 100%. Um, yeah, why is, it, why is it, it should be one? Okay, we can figure this out, right? It's not 61 here, but it's um, so it's one ninth. I think it should be 41, no? Huh? Should your second set No. No, because this is the probability that x2 is 2 given x1 is 1. So it's moving from 1 to 2. Why doesn't it add up to hmm?
So where is this? Okay, so looks like they say it's, this is one ninth. Where is this one ninth? Okay, thank you. That was a problem. And that's one third. Thank you. Okay, so this is 10 over 90, so one ninth, right? All right. Okay, so so all this computation was to just uh, figure out what is the probability distribution of this x2 random variable, which is this is with prob so it's equal to one with some probability equals to 2 equals to 3 with some probability, right? With probability uh, 61 over 90 with probability uh, what was it? 19 over 90 and this is with probability 10 over 90, right? Okay, which should add up to 1. Uh, so then you go to x3, right? Okay, but at this point you don't you don't want to do this uh, tedious computation again. But instead, what you want to do is the following. So <clears throat> you can you can no, you notice the following thing. So you notice that the probability that x n plus one is some value j, well j from one to three is actually the summation over all i of pij times the probability that xn was i. Okay? Which would be what? p1j probability that xn is 1 plus P2J, probability that Xn is 2, plus P3J times the probability that Xn is 3. Okay? This is in the case of three states, but if you have n state, you know, uh, five states, it would be summation over all five states and so forth, right? So, here's kind of the magic thing that happens is denoting pi n of i to be the probability that xn is i, what you're getting is you're getting a row vector which is pi n of 1, I don't know, let's say pi n of 2, pi n of 3, Then you can write this as a matrix multiplication, okay? You can simply write that, that uh, as being uh, the rope of, of, of pi n, right? Multiplied by the columns of p. Okay? So then we can write the following, that uh, pi n plus 1 is simply pi n multiplied by p. Okay, so in specifically, if I have three vec, I mean uh, it's a one by three row. So this is pi n plus n plus one state. This is going to be the three the the row at pi at time n, so pi n, and then I have multiplied by this columns, right? Yeah. So I was look we were looking at the wrong. Um, so you should be multiplying the values, the current values, uh, the probabilities that the, um, you know, xn is in any of the states, by the columns of this of this matrix. So 
So that's why when we look at the metrics above, somewhere here, um, it was always multiplying by these columns, right? So now, if you if you have to do x3, then you would just take the, the probability distribution of this x2, put it in a row, and multiply by p, and you're going to get the new row that's going to be the, the probability distribution of x3, and so forth. So in general, you're going to get the probability distribution of so this is going to be the probability distribution. So pi n is going to be the probability distribution vector, if you want, of xn. Okay, meaning that xn is going to be one with probability pi n of one. 2 with probability pi n of 2 and so forth. Okay. So finally we can go back uh, so we can go back and, and talk about uh, what happens with that uh, with us with our original uh, inventory problem. Uh, but so let me Introduce the last the last thing, which is called the limiting probability. Okay, so the limiting probability um, So if I have, if we start, let's say start with pi 0, then compute pi 1, which is pi 0 times p, pi 2, which is pi 1 times p, right? And this is pi 0 times p times p, or p squared. So in general, it's going to be pi n is going to be pi 0 times p to the n. So it's going to be a sequence of distribution vectors, right? So if pi n converges to some um, vector pi star, then pi star is called uh, a limiting probability. Or steady, uh, oh, actually, so, so it's a limiting probability, ability um, for the um, Markov chain or for the um, for the Markov chain, and the most important thing that's uh, going to be satisfied by pi star is that pi star. So remember pi n plus 1 is pi n times p and if pi n goes to pi star, pi n plus 1 also goes to pi star. So pi star satisfies this relation that pi star multiplied by p to the left I mean pi star multiplied to the left of p is the same as pi star. Right? And that means that pi star is a steady state distribution for uh, the Markov chain. Turns out that you actually um, you can compute this fairly easy because all, all this pi star is is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue 1 for p or p transpose. Right? So pi star is a left eigenvector for p, which uh, corresponding to to eigenvalue one, or if you don't like the word left eigenvector, then or pi star transpose 
is a right eigen or eigenvector for p transposed. Okay. So in MATLAB, you can actually when you type, when you put in this matrix and you look for you look for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, well, if p is a stochastic matrix, you're going to always get an eigenvector, uh, an eigenvalue of one, and the eigenvector that corresponds to that eigenvalue is going to be the steady state distribution. Uh, last word is how does how does this uh, reflect back to the inter to the uh, inventory problem? So if you do that, we computed the matrix. Uh, we computed that metric. So, so back to inventory problem. Pi star turns out to be the following: 0 0.285, 0 0.263, and 0 0.452. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about more uh, about how to actually compute this in practice. But with MATLAB, we can find those numbers by just putting that matrix P, uh, capital P. And the conclusion of, of this model is was to figure out the probability that the demand exceeds the inventory, right? So it was the question of what is the probability that in weak and, for instance, the demand exceeds inventory. So here's what you do is, again, you split into uh, the case when the conditional probability that demand exceeds inventory when inventory is 1 times the probability that the inventory is 1 and so forth, right? Probably that dn is less, greater than x n when x n is 2. We did in a second, x n is 2 and n 3, right? And now the question is what numbers uh, one needs to put in here? Well, what's the probability that the demand exceeds uh, x n when x n is one. Well, that's the probability that d n is greater than one, right? And that we know how to compute. It's basically one minus 0 0.0368 uh, minus 0.368. But the question is, what is this one? Uh, and that's where one uses the limiting probability for those values. The probability that xn is is 1 is 0 0.285, right? This is 0 0.263, and this is the pro this is 0 0.46, 452. Okay. So when you plug in these numbers. And you have to trust me on this or the book, you get something like 0 0.105, so this is 10%. So 10% chance that you, following that policy, you're going to actually uh, have, have um, the demand exceed the, the inventory. Okay? So on Wednesday, I'm going to show you kind of, uh, I guess, on you know, using MATLAB, how you can actually generate this limiting probabilities, um, either through the discrete dynamical system or through eigenvalues. Yep. Just uh, go back up when you're talking about the pi star as a left eigenvector for p. What's the word right after p? Corresponding to eigenvalue one. Okay. okay so we'll talk more about this on Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs>